This is a circuit board I designed, oh, some time ago. I can't even remember when I designed this. But the idea was that it was a modular signage system, but instead of being an intelligent signage system like the ones you see, the moving message signs that are programmable, and you inevitably see them just displaying gibberish or they're crashed or they're dead or there's just one pixel lit... Uh, instead of that, I want to design a simple system whereby you've got the black circuit boards and you populate them with your choice of LEDs. In this case, it would accommodate 3mm, uh, 5, 8, 10mm, um, or it would accommodate the 4-pin Superflux style LEDs. And you could just put, you could mix them if you wanted, but it was a resistor per LED. And you could make uh, circuit boards up using the sort of standard 5x7 dot matrix and using either a, a full 5x7 or for the thinner characters like I or one, uh, you could use the 3x7 panel and they'd just stack together and you'd basically make up signs. And one of the nice things about this is that it could be operated from a USB power supply because, you know, it operates at 5 volts or less. And I've got a sign um, that, uh, not here, but uh, a sign that's just, it was with a prototype, it says Clive, and it runs off a couple of AA cells. Um, and because the three volts, all that's needed for the red LEDs on it, with the resistors chosen to match, and it just runs for ages. And it's I just like the idea that you know it's signage that can be battery operated, um, or you know you can use a USB power supply and it's just a fixed message. It could say exit, it could say sale, it could say open, closed, it could say anything. But um, I got a batch of these manufactured, and it's notable I, I got them manufactured in China, and the idea. Originally, it was supposed to be a matte black front, and by the time, you know, I did all the extras on the matte black front with the red uh, screen print in the front, so you can just barely see the outline, but it doesn't get in the way of the LEDs. And the gold-plated back, and the back was supposed to be a different colour. It was supposed to be, um, I think it was red or yellow or something like that, just to make it easier to see the, sort of, uh, the legend there. But unfortunately, they just came out black anyway. But by the time I got these manufactured and shipped from China, it was quite a big circuit board, quite expensive to get shipped, um, and also quite expensive circuit board to get made. And then once I got the block of circuit boards here and I was shipping them back out, it cost even more. So it lasted one batch. And then I realised this is just too expensive because I wanted to keep these affordable, but um, it just wasn't viable with the cost of using Royal Mail because it's just their prices are astronomical. Um, so... Now, this circuit board design is on my website, and I just thought it'd be quite an interesting project right now to actually make one of these panels up, but I was going to actually make a question mark, but I'm actually going to populate every single position. I'm going to do it with the slow colour changing LEDs. Now, the slow colour changing LEDs are the type that when you uh, pass uh, current through them, they've got the chip built in that starts off red, and then it slowly changes to green, which isn't going to show up terribly well on the iPad, and then it changes to blue. And it just basically cycles through about seven colors, including white, and then repeats to red again. And these things, just for reference, they contain the three chips, the three LEDs, red, green, and blue, and they contain the control chip that actually drives them. And quite often you find these just run directly from batteries, but um, in this case, I'm gonna be using 100 ohm resistors because that kind of suits it keeps the, the intensity down to a, a lower level and also means the LED will be dissipating less on 5 volts The other thing I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to um, Do answer some of the questions and answers questions because that way it'll help pass the time as I solder this together So this is a, a matrix. This is uh, if you go to my website uh, if you hunt far enough, you'll find... I'll probably put a link down in the description below. It's the best bet. And it shows you the how to build these circuit boards. And I think it's still, unfortunately, the link to the shop saying you can buy them here because I did intend, hopefully, to restock them before I decided, no, I'm just going to put the files up. And you can... If you've got the print circuit board making facilities, you can make them yourself. So uh, maybe I should uh, change the website to reflect that. But in the meantime, let's start building this. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to use the 100 ohm resistors, I'm going to use the colour changing LEDs and I'm basically going to blanket cover this um, and talk while I do it. So to make it easier, I'm going to use this uh, printed circuit board assembly frame which is covered in dust, I should have really thought that before I started filming, but that's okay. <coughs> Uh, since uh, people will inevitably ask, this frame came from, I think it was either Maplin or Rapid, 
And it used to be made by Veleman, a sort of kit supplier. And uh, unfortunately I don't think they do them anymore. It's very useful, it uh, holds everything in place very well. So I'm going to start off by putting the resistors in. And these are just 100 ohm, 100 ohm resistors, it doesn't really matter which way around they go in. Um, they're not polarised in any way. And let's get on to the first question. So I was asked, when did I start taking things to bits? Well, apparently, that happened at the age of three. And I don't know, can, can that actually... I'm not really au fait with uh, what kids can do at specific ages, but I was told by my parents that at the age of three, I took the vacuum cleaner to bits. And bizarrely, I can actually remember doing it. Um, I think it was an old Electrolux of red-coloured vacuum cleaner with this cream panel at both ends, and it could suck in one end, blow out the other. Uh, and be used as a blower. Uh, my mum used to get the job of going around the garden spraying chemicals all over the roses, which was just delightful. Yes, lovely. Um, but uh, I do remember taking that thing to bits and struggling to get the motor back in. The motor sat in the middle of the unit um, and there was a cable loom ran under underneath it. And unfortunately, um, the cable loom... Uh, if it wasn't in the correct position, it was really hard getting the motor back in, and that's exactly what happened. I struggled for a while with that, but I got it back in and got the thing back together. And In hindsight, I wonder, was that thing unplugged? Because, you know, when you're three years old, if that was actually what happened then, I don't know if you actually know to check things like that, you know. Is it unplugged before I take it to bits? But, um, so that was uh, the first thing I started taking to bits. And it really, after that, my mum did something really special. She showed me how to connect a light bulb across a four and a half volt battery. And it was the old four and a half volt batteries that had, it was a lantern battery that had the sort of, it had three cells inside and a long tab and a short tab. And if you bent the tabs, you could actually make a lamp holder that would support the lamp. And uh, I don't think she knew what she was actually doing at the time that in the sense that she was kick-starting an electrical career. But uh, that's what happened. Then I discovered that uh, you could hold the lamps and I discovered wires and how you could hold all the lamps and stuff like that and parallel and series circuits and plasticine or Play-Doh to actually hold everything in position. It all just evolved from there. And then it went on to motors and relays and the rest is history. Next question. Oh, school. School to apprenticeship. I hated school. I was the school dunce. Absolutely. I detested school. It was like prison. Um, in the words of Les Dawson, school days, they say school days are the best days of your life, and it certainly gave me two of mine. The, the day I left, and the following day when I didn't have to go back again. That's so true. Um, but I left school at the age of 16. I tried leaving school, and actually, I went to an electrical company called uh, Hugh M. Fulton's in Glasgow, and uh, got an interview, and got the job, and then they discovered that I was only 15 and I couldn't leave school yet, which is a bit of a bummer. So I couldn't actually leave school and start, even though I'd got the apprenticeship. And in a way, that kind of worked out to my advantage, because the following year, um, and my mum kicks in again here and does the, the correct thing. Um, she's, she's got this amazing history of doing wonderful things in my life. She, um, she went to a career exhibition with me at the Kelvin Hall in Glasgow, and it was basically companies exhibiting what they did and, you know, encouraging youngsters to uh, apply for apprenticeships with them. And while I was just awestruck at all the computers, including some really weird military vector graphic computers, uh, while I was get, bit, getting distracted, my mum was actually asking people about uh, apprenticeships and who to apply to. And she got a form from a company called EGI Steel & Co Electrical Engineers, and I got my interview at EGI Steel and Co Electrical Engineers and my mum drove me there and attended because uh, back then it was traditional for a parent to attend the interview with you. And they pretty much gave me the apprenticeship right there and then. They said, yep, you, you can start. And my first day uh, was a bit of a wake-up call. Um, it was uh, out at Glengarnock Steelworks because EGI Steel and Co was a heavy electrical engineering company. What they did was power distribution in steelworks and the maintenance of the industrial plant and all the traction equipment in steelworks. And my first day of the apprenticeship was spent uh, in the DC hall of Glengarnock Steelworks. And I didn't realise at the time, 
But the thing, the big huge turbine blade thing that was about six foot tall, sitting in the middle of the place, was actually a glass mercury rectifier. I just didn't realise that until afterwards, you know, because it was covered in dust, it was all sort of black and sooty, because of it, it really... It took a real pounding, that uh, Mercury Rectifier, because it was fed from a substation that powered all the cranes and traction plants in the place. So it, it pretty much had its work cut out. Um, the apprenticeship was amazing. It was really heavy. It was back-breaking. It was industrial. And uh, it was just what I thought being... Well, I'd always aspired to a blue-collar job. It's something that just set in when I was young. It When I was... Uh, Again, the age of three-ish. It just It's an image that I, I just wanted to work. I couldn't wait to get away from school and be working. And this was everything that I thought work should be. It was like just a really industrial environment with heavy, you know, engineering dudes with the sort of broad shoulders and the overalls draping off them and the big, because it was traditional back then, the big wowser moustaches. It was just uh, what I expected engineering to be. It was great. A fantastic apprenticeship. If I, if I could go back in time, I'd just do that again because the atmosphere in the steelworks, like the Ravenscraig, Clydesdale, um, all, all the steelworks that we worked in, was just quite literally electric. Quite literally electric because there were arc furnaces. But, um, and they sounded... If you can imagine an arc furnace, when you're next to it, just it sounds like lightning. It's just thunderous and the the whole place vibrates you can feel the heat you can see the arcing light reflecting off the ceiling and uh, it's just an amazing experience the steelworks were just fantastic but that work also covered industrial uh, well industrial factory work and um, uh, running the bus bar systems for industrial plant um, and construction um, complete new builds um, I was involved in the uh, construction of Cummins engine cone shots for quite a period of time. And latterly in the apprenticeship, I moved into the electronics department, which was, it was too early in the industry to have a proper electronics department. Um, it was too kind of, what's the, what's the best way to describe it? You could only do so much. You could only repair so much. It was It was kind of, the hybrid mixture of electrical and electronic drives and systems uh, meant it was quite a volatile era and it was quite hard getting the data and the components you needed to repair stuff. Um, but um, latterly I left uh, EGI Steel & Co after spending a few years with them after the apprenticeship and I joined a company called Fourth Electrical Service for a while and that was interesting enough. And then a company called... Um, Thomas Johnson Shop Fitters, and that was uh, when I first really got my taste of independence, you know, working on my own, um, on contracts, taking the full responsibility for everything. That's when I also got my earring, because uh, it was traditional at that time that young tradesmen got a trade earring. Um, and you just saw the young tradesmen with their earrings at that time, that's why I got mine, it was just what was done at the time, sort of gold, the gold hoop, pirate style. Yeah, I loved the apprenticeship, uh, it was great, it was fantastic. Just It was it was a really arduous, heavy one, but it was really enjoyable. Uh, after uh, Thomas Johnson shop fitters, I went out my own, I went self-employed, um, and it turned out the type of work that suited me was just freelancing to companies, and because I'm perhaps pretty good at what I do. I didn't actually end up freelancing for that many companies. It was always the same companies. Uh, Hussman and uh, Northern Light were the main companies I worked for. Some other companies as well. Um, Caithness Stage and Lighting was quite a good company to work with. Uh, and yeah, just one or two others. Not that many. So um, let's uh, sweep this off. Uh, he said completely lacking somewhere to put it. One moment, please. Right, so let's start putting the LEDs in and go on to the next question. Have I recorded a video with no pants on? Really? Did someone actually ask that? Well, the answer is no. And the reason for that is, well, I used to live in a flat in Glasgow, which uh, 
I'm just going to make the sure notice the polarity here. It's positive at the top and negative at the bottom. Okay, get the polarity right. That'd be really helpful if I, I might even put all the LEDs in the right way around. <clears throat> I used to live in a flat in Glasgow, and one of the nice things it's top floor flat. Super privacy, absolute mega privacy. You could walk around in the complete scud in that flat and nobody could see you because even with all the windows open because it was the top floor flat. You were, I was up on a hill, massively spectacular view out to, to infinity into the hills and it was really private and I, it kind of, I didn't realise at the time it was super quiet as well, really, really quiet. And uh, it was just a basically very seclusive, secluded. It, it was really nice flat. It was when you close the door, it's particularly when you've been working away for long periods of time. You got back from the, all the hustle and bustle of work, and you close the door, and suddenly it was silent, absolutely silent, and you just felt so secure because nobody could see. You could see out, but nobody could see, and it was like a castle in the sky. Great. So uh, here. Uh, I'm living in a bungalow in the Isle of Man, which means everything is at ground floor level and it doesn't matter there are curtains over the windows and things like that. There's an element of paranoia that people can see in. When you've lived so long, you know, in a place that is, you know, up high that nobody can see in, I really struggled initially with the fact that, you know, there was no privacy here. MD could walk up to a window and look in. Not that there is MD around here. But um, that's why I wear pants when I'm making videos, ultimately. Next question. Do you enjoy YouTube or the lighting work? Which was better? Well, to be honest, I don't regard YouTube as a job. Uh, YouTube happens. And fundamentally, this is my workbench. This is where I'd normally take stuff to bits. And the only difference um, between the, from the YouTube side to normality is that there's a camera. There's the iPad up here on some little pull-out brackets and it's recording what I'm doing. I'm going to have to pause this video in a moment because uh, YouTube is a bit fussy about uh, long uploads and I see it's now approaching 17 minutes. Is that really 17 minutes? Blimey. So once I get these LEDs in, I shall just, uh, there'll be a slight jump uh, as I pause the video and start it again just so it, uh, I can upload it in two sections. But yeah, um, no matter what happens, uh, uh, YouTube has happened quite quickly, and you always wonder, is it going to be consistent? Is it, is, is it going to last forever? Is somebody going to come along that's got such a great channel that, uh, you know, nobody watches my channel anymore? You just never know. It's unpredictable. Uh, is the, you, the advertising revenue going to suddenly plummet to the point it's, you know, just you know, you couldn't ever have any financial security. It's just one of these things you don't know. It's kind of new, really. And I know YouTube's been around a long time, but it just has that sort of, you know, how long will it last? Um, and I, I could never give up real work because I like working. Fundamentally, I'm, I do enjoy working. I, I'm quite happy to go and put in a good shift somewhere because... Um, it's really gratifying. Um, so that answers that question. Uh, YouTube or lighting work? Both. I, I just couldn't, I need to work. So fundamentally, that's, I like diversity. I like the variety. And that also lets me record videos when I'm doing the sort of lighting work as well. So I'm just going to pause briefly and be back in a moment. And we're back. So I'm just going to get the frame. Uh, I've put the LEDs into this now. And I'm just going to get the cover this time. And... Clip it over like this, hinge it down, yeah, complete swamp out. That's okay, it's going to get turned over shortly. And then I'm going to start soldering the LEDs. There we go. This frame is great. It's so useful. I used it so much when I was uh, doing the uh, manufacture of the fairground light controllers. And then I moved on to a much bigger frame that could handle tons of circuit boards. I could do about 20 circuit boards at once. So let's start soldering. Uh, next question. Oh, right. What is my position on anal electrical stimulation for faecal incontinence? Really, I wasn't expecting that question, I have to say. And ironically, I do know exactly what it's about, because um, there is something called pelvic muscle stimulation, which is something, you know, you know those muscle exercises you get that uh, stimulate with pulse, electrical pulses? 
Well, it is used in the medical industry for um, strengthening muscles in the pelvic floor. So um, it's a thing, but I've never actually tried it, mainly because I don't have faecal incontinence. But you know what? If I ever get faecal incontinence, then maybe we can we can investigate that further in a video, probably without too much video footage of the unit in actual in use. But yeah, it, it's a real thing. It basically, it's the the little tens type unit. It causes muscle stimulation that builds the muscles up that would otherwise otherwise be weaker. I believe it's used by by women who have given birth to unusually large babies and their their butts don't work anymore. I could be wrong there, though. I might just be making that up for extra drama. <laughs> Next question. When did you grow a beard? Okay, rightio. When did I grow a beard? Well, I've always had a beard since secondary school. It was what's termed in the UK a bum-fluff beard at that point in time. Uh, very fluffy, and it was a chin beard as well. It didn't. Your beard starts growing down at the chin level. What I really wanted when I was young was a moustache because I saw the sort of workers in the neighbourhood with their baggy overalls and moustaches and I wanted a I wanted those baggy overalls, I wanted the moustache, I wanted that bonnet and the, the jacket, the traditional working jacket. All things that by the time I actually grew up they were all out of fashion. It was completely different anyway. But um the much coveted moustache that I wanted, uh and I have to say there's a there was a lot of jealousy going on here, particularly a guy called Mark McCabe, uh, I think he owns... He was working with Glendale Electrical. Um, and he was an apprentice at the same time as I was, but with another company. And we attended college together, the day release at college, and he had the most amazing moustache. And it's just this genetic thing that, you know, some people can grow it at an early age and some people can't. He owns his own company now. Uh, Electromechanical... E-M-E-S, E-M-S... E I can't remember. It's a four-letter name, I think. Pretty sure... But uh, he had the most incredible moustache at a young age, and I was so resentful. I was so jealous of that. Uh, but I couldn't grow one. And in reality, uh, although I could grow a modest beard, it wasn't until my late 30s that I could actually even grow a moustache. And that's when the beard kicked off as well. So if you want a beard, if you want a moustache and it's not happening, don't worry, it'll probably happen later in life. Now, I'm just going to sit these down. Actually, I'm going to look at them. Uh, do they need sat down? They're diffused. That one definitely needs sat down. That one is wonky as hell. So, yeah, I've, I've always had this sort of beard. But it varies in length from time to time in style. It's sort of, It's been Amish in the past. It's been... It's, I've even dyed the beard just uh, to try it out. I used that uh, ultra jet black... Uh, what do they call it? Um... Schwarzkopf um, XXL Rockin' Blacks. When I dyed my beard, I just went for... I went for gold with it. I, I went for the absolute blackest, most ridiculously black uh, beard dye I could find. And it was it was incredible. It looked so utterly fake. Um, I'm not sure why it went to uh, dyeing the beard. This beard, by the way, it's not dyed at the moment. It's its natural colours. One thing the dyeing of the beard did actually make me appreciate was just how diverse the colours in it are because of the... Well, when you're Scottish, it's going to be ginger. And it's going to be fair, and it's going to be brown and blonde. It's just going to be every colour, just because that's what happens. I'm kind of regretting taking out the frame now because it would have been slightly easier because it's kind of sliding about everywhere. But that's OK. We'll handle it. Next question. Biggest electric shock I had. I've, I've mentioned this before. It was it was in a supermarket off an automatic barrier gate um, and it was the control panel in it. And unfortunately, the person who had serviced the control panel because it was a barrier gate made by a company called Wanzel, if I remember. And the electronics were terrible in those units. Uh, I think it was a Wanzel. And the circuit board inside the metal case... Uh, all the connections went onto it, including the ground connection. And in the case of the ground connection, there, were, there was a brass spacer that was supposed to be in place between the circuit board and the case that grounded the case. But that spacer was missing, so the case wasn't grounded. And the other things that were missing were the plastic spacers that kept the circuit board away from the case. So uh, if there was no pressure on the cables, it was fine. When it, the unit kind of worked, except I forgot to put a connector on when I put it into the 
uh, the metal um, pillar that it goes into for the barrier. And it's really embarrassing because uh, to those uh, barrier gates and the alarm system, in the, if you push the gate open, which it had been pushed open, it pushed a pin up and set an alarm off. So to actually uh, turn it on in the sort of non-alarm mode, I had to shove the gate shut and then turn the power on and then wait for initialization period. And that's when a large queue of people started forming behind the barrier gate, all watching me working. <laughs> I turned it on and uh, <laughs> nothing happened. I'm standing there looking at the gate. They're all standing looking at the gate. Nothing is happening. And I think, oh, shit, I forgot that blimmin' uh, connector for the motor. So I pulled the, I thought, that's no problem. I can just pull it out and I can stick that connector on now. And I pulled it out the gate while holding on to the metalwork of the gate with my other hand. And as soon as the cables went taut, it pulled the circuit board against the case. Uh, the whole case came alive. And I just, you know, I just felt it go whomp right across my chest. It was like the worst shock ever. That LED is definitely going to have to be reseated a bit. I've, I've splurged. I've actually flowed soda between those two pins. But uh, to get access to that, I'll have to do it um, after I've uh, cropped the leads. Uh, so that knocked me flat my back, really. Uh, the... The unit, it, I chucked it, and it hit the gate in front of all these people, and there was a loud bang and a shower of sparks as the circuit board disintegrated into dust inside. Maybe maybe not dust. And I just, there was that pause, that moment, what the, you know, what just happened? And then I thought, oh, God, got to get the gate open. So I jumped up, I ran up the steps to the ceiling, disconnect the power, and then came down the steps, pulled the gate open, and then just slumped down behind it. And this fat woman, the first person through, just leant over and said, you got an electric shock, didn't you? And it was like, I just went, mm -hmm. <laughs> I just, oh dear. It could have been worse. It was Red Nose Day, which is a charity thing where you voluntarily wear red noses. And I was going to wear one that day, and I'm really glad I didn't. That would have been the icing on the cake. So that was, without doubt, the worst shock I've ever had. It, it was a full-on whomp right across the chest. And worst of all, it was in front of people. Afterwards, uh, I disconnected the controller. And I went over and sat against a pillar in the shop, the supermarket, Safeway in Gifnock, if you must know. And I opened it up to investigate and uh, found all the spacers missing and the big huge skid mark inside it. Well, it was basically the inside the metal case was well and truly copper plated. Next question. Brexit. Now, Brexit is a thing about uh, Britain leaving the European Union. You know what? As far as I'm concerned, the European Union is more a sort of political thing. Because... Even before the European Union happened, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Britain was part of Europe. I mean, Holland, Germany, France, you know, all these countries, Italy, Spain, are just part of the continent of Europe, so to speak. So I've always dealt with Europeans. I've got European friends. Nothing has changed. So even when Britain leaves Europe, uh, it's not going to make much of a difference because we never even accepted the currency in the first place. It's all very political. It's all very silly. I've always uh, had an affinity with Europeans and always will have an affinity with Europeans. Right, where's this? Uh, where's that LED that I completely blobbed? Um, one of the things that I won't be too sorry about is losing political influence from Europe, because some of the rules and regulations, you know my my pet hate is, of course, the lead-free solder one, but uh, there are so many other really retarded regulations that they brought in that were so technically ill-conceived that uh, they're not, you know, I'm not going to miss, I'm not going to miss the rulemaking and meddling, because it just seems like they're, all the rules that come out of Europe seem to be made by people with no technical ability, it's just a bit disappointing in that way. But you know what? I don't think it's really going to make much difference in the long run. It's all just political. Now, that is a circuit board more or less complete. So here's a USB lead. And the first thing I'm going to do, as I usually do... Oh, it looks a pretty shitty lead, but not to worry. Let's plug it into a USB power supply and check the polarity is right on the wire. So let's plug this in. 
Next question, why do I use Americanisms? Well, you know, the internet, the primary language of the internet, I think you'll agree, is English. And there's two ver two major variations of English. There's American English and there's English English. Yeah, Plart is right. And I interchangeably use American words. I like America. It's a bit big and brash. I don't think I could live there. It's a bit full on. It's got it's evolved very quickly. Um and it's of uh, it's got some weird political quirks and things. I don't think I could live there, but as I say, I like the whole brashness, the bigness, and I like the hard working ethic of of America. I like the I like the clothing of America, I like the people of America. <laughs> Um, so I do use Americanism, but you'll also notice that I also tend to um, use metric and imperial measurements. I tend to give both. And that's to cater because the Internet's just a big place. It covers Europe, it covers America, it covers other countries. Well, it covers the whole world, really. And I just like to cater for everybody because there's nothing more annoying than a, a measurement be given the completely a, something you, you just don't understand, a, a measurement value, you know, like... Uh, saying that I'm just going to solder this, this with 10 megatrillions or something like that. It just doesn't make sense. It's, when people give their height or weight uh, in a sort of non-standard measurement you're not used to, it just it, it means you have to try and go and convert it. And Yeah, it's an inconvenience. I'd like to allow for that. Someone else asked, what do I think of the Germans? The Germans are very interesting because... They take everything so seriously. Of all the Europeans, the Germans are the most hardcore and serious. And it's kind of interesting. I love German engineering. It's just over the top. It's like super rugged. And they've got again, they've got a great work ethic. There's that work ethic thing again. Yeah, the Germans, I find them a wee bit scary because they take things so seriously, but also really impressive engineering-wise. I've been in Germany. I went to Dusseldorf, to a big fairground there. I, this is ready to plug in. Is it all going to work? That's not lighting. That means there may be either... Oh, there is. There's a soda bridge. That's okay. Let's remove that soda bridge. Soda bridge has been removed. And let's plug this in. Uh, and will I turn the light off and see if it auto-adjusts? Oh, yes. So... Initially, because these are self-colour changing LEDs, they're all going to change roughly in sync. Looks pretty good, doesn't it? But because of the very nature of these LEDs, they'll gradually then move out of sync. Everyone has its own little RC oscillator inside, and it means that they, they don't hold proper sync. And that over time, they'll drift quite heavily. I mean, this one is leading the others uh, quite predominantly. Um... So this is the first one after that's going to turn red. There it goes. And over time, they'll just completely shift out of sequence. So um, that's actually looking pretty good. I'm kind of liking that so far because it is very random and colourful. Now, I don't know if I mentioned at the beginning of the video, these colour-changing LEDs, if you do a search on YouTube, YouTube, eBay, for... Uh, five millimeter RGB slow. Those are the keywords. Um, but also, it's helpful to say uh, 100 PCS, 100 pieces, because that's how the Chinese tend to describe the quantities um, of these things. So, 100 pieces, five millimeter RGB slow. And another good word to put in it is diffused, because the diffused ones are nice because they mix the colors really well. And as you can see, it really is starting to drift way out of sequence now, and it's quite good, isn't it? Just gonna lift it up a wee bit further. Swamp, swamp, swamp. Yeah, it's swamping out. Was that a good idea? Probably not. I'll put it back down. Um, and as I say, I'll put a link in the description down below to the printed circuit board files for this. Uh, it's not that viable to manufacture these anymore because, as I say, when the cost of people, if they ordered, say, for instance, uh, ten then the price came out to something like, it was over £5. The base charge was about £3.50. And then it was roughly, it worked out, 50 pence per circuit board. So it added such a huge chunk that the post office was actually making more money off these circuit boards than I was. And that just made it non-viable to make them. 
But yeah, I'm liking this. I'm thinking I could actually put that in a frame. It's almost worth designing a new circuit board just dedicated to accommodating these colour-changing LEDs because that is quite nice. But anyway, that's this video. Um, and it's the it's the first part of the questions answer, answers video because there are so many questions that were asked and they all have to be answered. So um, yeah, this is just the start. Uh, I'll be doing more answer videos.